first of all, I need to thank you for coming. And there's some things that we need to say immediately, and that is to thank Joe over Street, Green Jennings, the Kettleman House, Woman Jennings Gallery for hosting this event. Give them a big, yes. big, big round. I want to thank Randy and Fatu. It makes me cry. Okay. Um, what we were introduced to me to Randy Weston in the 70s wow. in the subway. No. And I saw this big tall guy coming and he said, wait, that's Randy. And that's how I met him. That was my introduction to him um, through my late husband, Wilbur Ware. Melba was a different uh, matter. She came back from Jamaica, having spent five years there. And Kobe can tell you a little bit about what happened when she came back. But immediately when I met Melba Liston, she just took me under her wing like I was her little sister. And we started the Wilbur Ware Institute, Clifford Jordan, Sandy Jordan, and myself in Philadelphia before Wilbur died. And Melba was one of the people that came and did music for us. She did live jazz in the neighborhoods, Melba Liston and Company in 1981. And in this band, she had Dottie Dodge and Al Gray, Kalinza, Carlene Ray, Larry Smith, and Chester Tanksley. Then she came back the next year and did Marvelous and Big Band in 1982. And in that band was the only other woman who's going to be our co-moderator today, Janice Robinson, was on trombone in this band. And you can look at these posters when you get a chance because they're special. That's why they're laminated. <laughs> I'm keeping them. After uh, we're finished here today, Maxine Gordon had uh, wrote a wonderful article in the Black Music Research Journal about Melba and Dexter Gordon uh, and Mr. Slady Date, that tune that he wrote for Melba. That's in this journal. You have to see me for this. And without further ado, I want to tell you about the distinguished people that are going to talk to you today. But first, you need to meet the curator, Ed Sherman. Ed was kind enough to step in when uh, we needed a curator. Our, our trusty board member is so busy, but you need to meet her too. Dorothy White is in the place. Graphic artist and Jordan is here, without whom I could not breathe. <laughs> she is here. So, and I hope Randy um, has a lot to say after we hear from these people who have come to share their knowledge of Randy and Melba and that 40 year collaboration. We have Daniel Dawson. Yay. Those two beautiful photographs he took are in the other room. Charlotte Cox. Charlotte Ferguson is back with me along with Mo, her Mobutu uh, as well. Kobe, our impresario. <laughs> Kobe Narita. <laughs> for coming. And Maxine, okay. oh, Maxine, sorry. Okay. okay. And Dick Griffin <laughs> is also in the first. Who am I missing? Janice. 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 Janice, moderator, I'm going to give it up to her. Oh. I'm going to give it up. Yeah. 
up. He may yet show us. <laughs> but Jan, go ahead. But Janice Robinson is going to moderate this, and she knows what to do. <laughs> Gloria, you are full of surprises. <laughs> When Gloria mentioned the whole idea to me, I, of course, shrunk back into the corner. Randy Weston, Melba Liston, artwork, oh my goodness. No, I think I will just sit in the audience. And she said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'll just help you from the audience. Next thing I know, she has me on the program as the moderator. <laughs> so please bear with me. Uh, this would be my first time in this position. Jimmy Owens in the audience. Oh, yeah. So thank you all again for coming out this afternoon. Um, we are all honored with the presence of wonderful artists and musicians. Randy Weston came out to help support this event and salute all the artists and all the work that has been done. And uh, as she said, I hope Randy will speak I think we should begin with an uh, introduction, everyone, if we could all say a, a few words about ourselves and how we come to this work today. Uh, well, my name is Dick Griffin, and I'm a trombonist who um, uh, paint as well. And um, from uh, Jackson, Mississippi, I came to New York in 67. And um, I started off performing with Rasan Ru and Kurt, and that's when I met most of the great musicians, and, and uh, been here ever since. Kind of in the um, mix of uh, performing jazz, and uh, lately I've been painting. <laughs> really nice. uh, Maxine Gordon. <coughs> I met Melba, oh, about me. Uh, I wrote an essay in here. <laughs> that tells who I am. That's who I am. But uh, um, should I talk about Melba first? No, just or later. Just who I am. Yeah. Maxine Gordon. <laughs> and, how do you, and how do you come to us today, Ms. Gordon? Because I wrote an essay in the Center for Black Music Research Journal, okay. Melba Liston. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, I'm Kobe Narita, and I'm going to talk about Melba when she was here. And I'm sorry I don't speak too clearly. I, I have Parkinson's for 10 years, so, so I'm losing my ability to speak. Speak fast. My name is Charlotte Cobb. So happy to be here, and, and I just feel as if this is my artistic family. I've been exhibiting for many, many years here at uh, King Kelba, and they've been very supportive. And I just thank everyone for coming, and it's just so, it's such an honor to be here to, to uh, honor uh, Randy Weston and Melba Weston. Hi, I'm Dan Dawson, and I'm a photographer and a curator and a scholar. And I work, uh, in fact, I've worked with jazz since, I've photographed jazz since 1963, 62. So I have a long history of working with jazz and photography. I'm a trombonist, a teacher and composer who has heard the name of Melba Liston since I was a teenager in Pittsburgh, um, Pittsburgh area, Pennsylvania. Um, I met Melba here in New York before she went to Jamaica and we talked about trombones, we talked about mouthpieces, we talked about the mechanics of the instrument. Uh, later on, I was able to observe her with the uh, New York Jazz Repertory Company when there was a uh, Dizzy Gillespie reunion band. And that was wonderful. Um, she's just cool, calm, and collected. And uh, just, a, just very appreciative of all the musicians that she had worked with, and just very honored to be, you know, playing and among the best, of course. Um, later on, um, Melba, called and asked me to become a member of her um, Melba Liston and Company. Um, and I was uh, thrilled because it, was, it had been all those years and I had to fill in blanks about Melba. I had heard wonderful stories, of course, from 
many musicians and um, teachers that I had over the years. Uh, do you remember Melba Liston? Did you ever meet Melba Liston? And uh, it, it, you know, the stories were always of this musician of such stature that they, they just, uh, we had great deal of respect for her and her work. Melba was basically a self-taught trombonist and a self-taught arranger composer. Um, as a child, she, she was attracted to the trombone and to writing. And um, without formal training, she developed to such a high level of skill, masterful in fact. Uh, when I mentioned, when I, was, when I heard from, um, for instance, mainly trombonist Curtis Fuller who had worked with her, he always talked about Melba, she was like a sister to him, um, very watchful and very caring and um, expert on the trombone. She could not be missed. She, she read well, she soloed, she played well, she was adventurous as a writer. She, she, um, she came up to whatever the occasion required. Uh, she wrote for small groups. She wrote for, um, I was listening today to an album of music that she uh, wrote for Elvin Jones. Uh, wonderful pieces for small groups. Some of them were very kind of a, a modern avant-garde jazz, as you, you know, as they say. Uh, even though she had some experiences, of course, long ago with the uh, Sweethearts of Rhythm. Uh, she was able to observe people, I think, in that situation. That one didn't continue very long. <laughs> but uh, some of the other relationships, of course, continued many years, those with uh, Dizzy Gillespie, and of course with Randy Weston for over 40 years. And um, the writing, of course, with Randy Weston, um, is like the composer and the arranger are seamless. Mm -hmm. And this is very unusual. In, in the world of jazz and in the world of writing and in the world of composition, that there would be that kind of, of unity uh, within the writing. And the writing went from um, small group work up to orchestral works. She wrote um, for Clark Terry. Now, many years ago, she did uh, writing for Clark Terry, and the, and the music was performed for the Buffalo Philharmonic and other orchestras. And it, it's, a, it's, it's really amazing that, um, that she stepped forward in those ways when she was an, a person who did not speak about herself. She did not talk about all her achievements. She did not, you know, I'm Melbourneist and you follow me and step behind me and I was here first and I've been here longer and all that sort of thing. Uh, when we worked together in Melba Liston and Company, it was all about the music, focusing on the music, articulating the music in the way that she had expected it to be done. She was very gentle about it. Um, I think in terms of my own career, um, we played with some of the same people uh, many, many years later. and. Um, was always um, sort of a feeling of, 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 of support. You know, I, I was able to do those things. Of course I had to fulfill the job, whatever the job called for, but the fact that Melba had done it so well allowed me to be able to be hired. Clark Terry, well, he knew Melba's he, a reputation. He had worked with Melba. So I, uh, I came along, and I'm playing, and, and he already know He doesn't have to go through whether a woman can do this on an instrument that is normally played by a man. Um, and I think Clark Terry with Dizzy Gillespie, um, Melba, we were talking about the arrangements that um, that Melba did the Latin side. She did some uh, uh, Latin music um, and those arrangements in Dizzy Gillespie's book, which uh, were there for many, many, many years. And uh, I think next year, possibly, there may be some more performances of that music at the Harlem School of Arts in, con in um, combination with the uh, Wilbur Ware Institute, which so wonderfully has been um, pushing this movement um, forward to let all of us enjoy the music of Melba Liston and the arrangements of Melba Liston. I don't know, some of you are, are, were at the concert Friday night at the Manhattan School of Music 
which was produced with um, the Wilma Ware Institute mm -hmm. and Manhattan School of Music. And students there, with Randy Weston and his group, it was a wonderful concert, it was excellent. There was also a pre-talk, um, a pre-concert talk, uh, which was co-produced by the Wilma Ware Institute and Manhattan School of Music, and that was also very informative. And um, it's wonderful that Gloria has this vision uh, and foresight about Melb's music and her importance and her place in the scheme of things uh, around the world. So we hope to, that you will uh, also follow those events and um, come, come and support uh, the work that the World War Institute is doing around um, Melba Liston. <clears throat> Um, I would like, uh, excuse me? I, I'm, I'm really very anxious to hear uh, about the artist and their approaches to these works that have been presented around Randy Weston and Melba. Uh, Charlotte, would you like to talk about yes. that? I look at this, I, it's just miraculous, this show to me. All the different media, the colors, the patterns, the interpretations, they go from cardboard, who could do everything that you see, such a lovely painting in the back by Ron Walton from ordinary material cardboard. It's just wonderful. And also my husband, Errol, he did a piece that represents Randy, from, uh, we were, actually we were going down the street in Pittsburgh, we now live in Pittsburgh, and we're building this gallery, so we're always looking for building materials. We're going down Forbes Avenue and Duquesne University, they are doing some building there. So Mo, <coughs> this wood from the, it would have ended up in the garbage heap, and he made this wonderful portrayal uh, Randy with Melba Listing hovering in the spirit world over her. And uh, this piece by Ron um, Carter, the piece with the grandmother showing the, the child, it's just so reminiscent of my mother too when she asked, she's trying to get me to play piano. I, mean, I did it until I was 12. But um, it's just reminiscent of families that want their children to advance in music and keep going and from Pittsburgh at one time. I think it might still be. I'm not really sure about what's going on with the school system now, but I know at one time the, the, music, uh, the music instruction was wonderful in the elementary, high school, and le level. For instance, I'm from a small town called Cressus Terrace, which is, uh, Janice is also from Pittsburgh. But this, this little town is a small town of people that came to Pittsburgh from the south to work in the steel mills and Wetson House Corporation. So to give you an um, idea of this instruction, my sister Kim, who sadly passed away two years ago, but she played cello in the school system in Pittsburgh and her daughters had the same teacher that she had playing cello, just to show you the essence and the, 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 the instruction, the musical instruction at that time. So. Um, and others in the show, Miss, um, there's a beautiful mosaic back there by Miss Grace Williams, the mosaic artist. Uh, the second piece that's all sparkly and glittery. It's a wonderful interpretation of the spirit inherent in the, in the uh, work. And this one by Dinga, who takes pieces of fabric and weaves it together in a wonderful work. So it's just, I thought it was wonderful how they, uh, individual pieces were came together so beautifully through Mr. Sherman and his curating and Donna Bunn who put it together with and um, uh, Miss Jennings and Joe the way they orchestrated this it was like I think it's like a symphony of love for Randy and for Mel Liston. it's just like symphonic to me and uh, I hope that you could all get a chance to see all the work my piece is in the back it's a, a piece that I was thinking of Randy looking out over, you know, living in Morocco, 
Morocco, looking out over the Caribbean and seeing Spain. Uh, you know, so I was thinking of his, the universal brutality of his work and how he has been able to bridge the arts of Africa and the Caribbean with our jazz. He's like, he really is our national treasure. A treasure and was so, I'm just such an honor to be in his presence, to have him here vibrant and alive and still still creating. It's just wonderful. We, we, we I'm so glad that we can honor him now. You see, because so many times, And then we honor, but if we're honoring him, he can smell the roses about. Right. You know, so uh, it's just, it's just, um, I'm just so happy to be here, and um, and I'll talk later about maybe Pittsburgh or something else. But right now, I'll get it back to to Danny. No, I'm really happy to be here also. But how many other people in the room are artists in the show? How many different people in the room are artists? Just stand, please, and just say your name. Yeah. from 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and I wanted to make sure, you know, but then I looked at the work and wasn't that good. So I said, oh my God, I've trapped myself in this show and I have to do some work. So I called Randy and said, Randy, can, can, I, can I come out and take some photographs? And I ran out there a week before the show took the photographs and had them out frame. So there was, there was a very recent piece and there was an older piece. But before I go, I, I would be remiss if I don't introduce a friend from the audience and say, could, could uh, Dr. O'Mealy please stand up please? Oh, Dr. O'Mealy. Uh, Robert G. O'Mealy, he's the one who founded Jazz Studies at Columbia. He started the Jazz Institute the, of, of Jazz Scholars. But he also is one of the pioneers in associating jazz and the visual arts. So he, he did a book for the Smith, uh, a, a exhibit for the Smithsonian, how many years ago, 20 years ago, uh, about jazz. He also did a, a book that he co-edited with some other friends from Columbia called The Jazz Cadence of American Life. And that just brings us to an understanding in terms of me and the visual arts and in terms of photography, that jazz and photography came of age at the same time. Yeah. So so much of what, how we reference jazz, we reference it through photography. We just did a panel yesterday at NYU on South African photography, mm -hmm. and you saw the same parallels. Mm -hmm. You saw the arts come to life with the age of photography. Mm -hmm. It was about photography, but the, one of the main focus of the artists, particularly the artists from this drum magazine, were on the musical forms. Mm -hmm. And the musical forms continue, but you're talking about Masakela and um, uh, Miriam Makiba, and there's a whole slew of people very much paralleling our lives in, in terms of the United States. But that's one of the reasons is because jazz and photography are associated, that they come together at the same time. But as Bob pointed out in his book, that the cadence of modernity, our whole ideas of modernity are coming through jazz as a musical form. Jazz is a musical form of, for a so-called modernity. And, um, I, I'm in a group called Kamonge. Kamonge has uh, celebrated its uh, 50th anniversary last year. We've been together arguing for 50 years about the garden. <laughs> you know, but we, we had to, because it was our 50th anniversary, we had to do some kind of um, wonderful visitors coming back in, too. I hope Sly Hampton is in the house. In the house. Right. <laughs> about when, when we talk about jazz and visual arts and jazz and photography is that they are inseparable in, in many senses that you know so when we were doing this whole biography of Kamonje we come in, we, had, we had to interview each member and we were finding out well what were your influences in terms of creating your art and so everybody had the kind of standard uh, photographers of the time, Cartier Bresson and um, uh, Roy Nicaragua and Gordon Parks, but also um, uh, Eugene Smith. So there were a whole slew of people who had kind of contemporary, formed the contemporary world of photography. 
But then all the members started talking about their influences and making their photography as Miles Davis and John Coltrane and Duke Ellington. Yes. So you know, there's an understanding of that being the kind of underpinning of excellence in terms of the artistic standard. That if you want to talk about the greatest, I hate to quote Albert Murray and have him write, but if, if, you, if, if, if you want to understand the excellence in the artistic world of, of African American culture, jazz is the highest excellence that there is on the planet. If you, if you want to follow, that translates into the visual arts is also jazz. The art forms are really inseparable. They're kind of self-reflexive and self-creative. Um, self they, they keep you creative in whatever form you are. So I guess that was just my two cents about jazz and the visual arts. <laughs>
you know, we all we in the we are in the highlight of our what's it with the twilight of our lives. And, and no, we are. We're just basically <laughs> we're in the twilight of our lives. Everybody, you know, I mean, uh, you know, but to see him walk in, that was just like me coming to Jackson, I mean, coming from Jackson, being in 1964 at Birdland and seeing Coltrane and seeing. Yeah. Uh, Burke Powell and seeing all of these Sonny Rollins drove up to me in the car and he said, hey man, have you seen Bud Powell? You know, this is the first time I saw Sonny Rollins in person, you know. Oh man, I should stop. Because <laughs> 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 well, I could go on and on and on, but this is, this is where my, I, my feelings are and I'm so excited and so honored to be next to my hero and like I tell you, it's, it's, I'm not lying. Just to hear that arrangement, man, that high, uh, high five arrangement this morning, I listened to it because I wanted to know the changes. And I know the changes now because I, I had to find out where that E flat minor 2 5 came in. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, back to that. So, um, I can talk about the piece that I did. Now, I did a piece called Music for Mel. And my association, first time I really got really in, in, in touch with Mel, but is I played a concert at Alice Charlie Hall, I just get verified by Randy, that it was me and Al Gray playing trombones. Were you on that concert, Jimmy? I think it was Richard Williams and Virgil Jones. I know those two people were there. But anyway, it was a concert, and Mario Basso, the great alto, he was playing lead. Now, we played this concert, and when you're playing in a group as a trombonist, usually you playing in a section. You know, like the trombones play and the trumpets play, and Melville didn't write like that. She paired her voice. You might be playing with a, a tenor saxophone and a flute, mm -hmm. just the trombone. And I remember you, you really had to count. And she was so nice. She was a, oh, darling, honey, uh, you gotta, you gotta count now. You gotta come in here. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But I remember that I had to really get there and uh, just concentrate and not worry about if Al Gray wasn't playing, I wouldn't be playing. Her music was so different mm -hmm. and so beautiful. I mean, I could actually, every time, every eight bars was different colors. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's why, oh man, that was impressive. And now, back to Miova, I, I, I write a little music myself, compose, and I wanted to study with Miova. So I, I you know, knew a, a, a guy, was a, a guy named Charles Wood, he was, uh, so he said, yeah, I got an LA address, come on by, you know. I called up and I came by. And at that time, I had uh, gotten a grant to do a, a work for symphony orchestra and jazz quartet. So I wanted to learn, because everything I did was just, I'm self-taught. Uh, you know, so I went by and we talked with sitting there. Mel was just so nice, she said. Then she said, uh, this, uh, let me hear something you're playing. <laughs> so, I played the work, she looked at me and said, mm, you go home and write. <laughs> she don't need to study anything, but she was so, so nice. And, and, and she said, no, nah, no, nah, just look, just, if you have any problem, just call me. You know, don't bother me. Just keep writing, write, 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 write. So that was it. And the painting, let me go to that. Now, I'm going to tell you how I conceive paintings. I try to, in my paintings, I try to, to, capture of spirit of the person. Now, Melba was an elegant person. She was a beautiful woman, very attractive, mm. and just, but yes. she was beautiful inside and out. So what I thought of first, I thought of, okay, pink, you know, uh, was sort of for the feminine side of her. So the pink piece, if you see it in there, and in the M, in the middle, that big M is the M. That M means music, and that M means Melba. Mm. So it's the abstract there. And on the left side, if you look closely, there's a note. And then on the right side, you have the feminine side where, you know, like the hair doing the whole thing. So that's what I was capturing. Then I thought about in college, the pink and the green was the AKA. So I was saying, you know, really, I mean, that's what it was, you know, that's Sarachi. So I thought of her being, you know, uh, of, a, of a higher standard, you know, like so, like a queen or, or something that you are, are mm. carried. You nobody put that, you know, honor on it. That's what I was thinking. So I can 
say that that's what that piece was all about. I don't want to take it too long. Wow. section, but uh, since I'm here, I get to ask now. <laughs> uh, do you listen to music while you're paying? Uh, here. I, I, I tell you what, I used to, okay. I hear music when I'm painting, and then I, I used to play this song, uh, You Taught Me, and was, You Taught My Heart to Sing by my poor time. And I can hear that in my head all the time. So I used to play it overnight, and I paint a lot at night. And uh, I, I, I get the colors, because I have to see the colors in the day. But a lot of times when I do my little detailed things, I do it at night, because it's not even about colors. And uh, if you look at that painting I, I did, there's a technique that I use. It, it, it takes hours and hours and hours and hours, and I'm doing it with my fingers. And I do brushes, and I do runs and I have to lean and stuff. But it takes a lot of time to do that. So sometimes I do that work at night. So I do hear music and I listen to uh, my, that song. You taught my heart to sing, uh, McCoy time. Yes. <laughs> and that first, uh, the first record that, um, like I say, that Slide Hampton record that you, I listen to your music a lot, a lot. Those, you say that in the time. Yes. Oh, I was just saying, and Sly Hampton's music, and those are my favorite thing. Uh, I, I, the Sister's uh, Salvation record, I, I listened to those over and over again because I thought that was such a uh, beautiful way he used instruments without the piano mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, no guitar, but he, he, he sculptured that stuff so, so beautifully. Yes, I, I was the last one born into my family. My father ran out of everything by the time he got to me. <laughs> all my brothers and sisters were all very talented with the, being able to hear everything and remember everything. I didn't remember, I don't and didn't remember anything, and I couldn't hear a thing. It's ten air. But that was because he had run out of it when he got to me. But I did know that how much ever I thought I knew, there's a lot more to be learned. And that's because of all the music that came before us, hundreds of years. We can't stop now. If, you, if you're a good musician, you're not as good as you could be. Mm -hmm. You have to right. keep learning from Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker. Mm -hmm. now, and they were great musicians. Right. And they were always listening to music. They were all listening and learning. And we have to do the same thing in music or out of music. Always learning is the thing that we have to do on the planet. That's a true fact. I'm very proud of that because. Uh, Rasan Roland Kirk was, a, was my band leader for 10 years and mentor, and, and I worked with him. I did a lot of recording with him. But every time I went to his house, he was listening. He would go to sleep. We'd sit there, and he'd nod off, nod off listening to classical music, listening to something. He was listening all the time, whole train. I heard he just practice, practice. He'd practice and fall asleep with his horn in his hand and then wake up practicing. So the definite music has to be just around you, in you, I mean out of you. Yeah. Would you like to talk a little bit more about um, relationships with music and uh, art? I think as, as I mentioned before, as Bob said in his book, The Jazz Cadence of American Life, that um, it's so normal that we don't think about it. It's so much the common ground by which we operate in that you don't think about jazz as part of that life. For example, the, um, some of the major painters, like Stuart Davis and Jackson Pollock, they painted the jazz. But that's just the ones we know who we talk about. But almost every one of them did, you know, because that's the atmosphere that creates modernity. And you end up with Maholi Negan, but he's European doing the same thing. You know, there, there, there's this understanding, not, not Maholi Negan, I'm thinking of um, Broadway Boogie Woogie. Um, Madrian, Madrian. But so you, you can't even think of it as like a United Statesian phenomenon. It's a, a world that becomes so-called modern world based on the music that we call jazz, and it becomes the background for that. And you know, there's no no um, uh, film that doesn't use that music. That you don't you don't even think of it as a thing. It's normal. It's normal for jazz to be the background. You know, it should be the foreground, but it is, it's normal for us to be the palette by which we paint our, our terms about modernity. 
I mean, again, another brief thought about it, too. I'd also I'd like to mention the concept of improvisation, too. Right. It's, so, um, it's so important in jazz and art that you have to just go with the, sort of like going with the flow, let the painting, I, what I do is I, a lot of times I let the painting speak to me as what it wants to be. And I think that that concept of just letting things flow and not, I never have like a, a, a concept that I'm ahead of time. I let the painting speak to me. And uh, jazz is very important in my life also. I can remember coming from uh, Cooper Union and going across the street to Slug. Uh, not slugs, the five spots, hearing Mingus, right after class, hearing Mingus and going down to slugs, and it was a rich, wonderful education. I, I can say that I was trained in these universities, but where I really got my education in art was from the streets of New York, and for people I would meet for being with uh, the way you see uh, group and where we at, NCA, just meeting these mm. folks that had the music and the art in their essence, in their souls. So you learn technique from these schools, but to learn the spirit of the, of the art, I think you learn that from other people and from special teachers. Like when I had my first black teacher, actually, was Bob Blackburn. Mm -hmm. I had him at Cooper Union, all through <coughs> school in Pittsburgh. I had the only black teacher I had was in Sunday school. But when I came up to New York and met Robert Blackburn, the eminent wonderful printmaker. So um, I, I can see that jazz has been very important in my artistic development, because this improvisation is very important to me. Roots and rhythm. Of course, we know that Randy not only has he been a prolific composer, teacher, recording artist, he has been educating all of us and reminding us about our roots our African roots, the home of uh, humankind. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, 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 without hesitation, <laughs> he, he brings us back to our roots that we talk about. That's true. Uh, um, rhythm, of course, in music often, and rhythm in life, and rhythm in, um, in our artwork. And uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about that particular relationship. I'm going to talk about bringing it back, uh, about the rhythms that African peoples carry to this country oh, yes. that had so much to do with uh, our contributions in music mm -hmm. and art and many other aspects of uh, life here in America. Mr. Yeah. I think Mr. Randy? Randy? Yeah. <laughs> the rhythm is right here. <laughs> Look at all the love in this beautiful gallery. Look at all the love. You know, to acknowledge a great, great woman. Uh, Melbourneistic. I could be here till tomorrow if I talk about Melbourneistic. <laughs> but there are several things that we have in common. Love of family, love of people, ancestors and elders. It's very important, everything that we did. I was, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, Red Star. And, you know, we used to hang out wherever the music was. We go to Harlem, we go to 52nd Street, wherever we go, we hear the music. So this particular night, Dizzy's band was at Birdland. And I was there. And he introduced Lee Morgan and, and Charlie Pacif and all the cats, wonderful, great artists, you know. And then he introduced Melba Liston. And he said, this Miss Liston, she's a trombonist. And she's written this arrangement of my reverie. So I saw this beautiful woman with this trombone. I never saw a woman with a trombone before. And she had this big, fat sound. She had a huge sound on the trombone. Dick knows about that more than me, I'm sly. Yeah. So she was featured, she played the mouth, she played a solo, and it was so beautiful, you know. So when she came off the bandstand, I just went up to her like that, because for me, everything is spirit. Sometimes you can communicate with people and never a word is spoken. 
That's what happened with me and Monk, for example. And Monk and Melville were very similar because they didn't say very much. But they were some serious heavyweights in music. I introduced myself to Melvin. Listen, I said, your arrangement, your trouble is fantastic. And we exchanged numbers. She went back to California at the Dizzy's band. I think his band broke up. And she came back to perform with Quincy Jones' band. They had a, a, a theater production called Free and Easy. So she lived in Manhattan, and uh, we met each other. And I told her I was a pianist, and I just got a, a contract for United Artists. And I always love children because I think children are so rhythmic, they're so free, they're so close to nature. They've not been conditioned like we've been conditioned, right? So I wrote seven waltzes for children. One for my son, one for my daughter, one for children climbing the hill, one for children ice skating, one for children singing the blues. And I made little piano arrangements on the piano. So I asked Melba, would she do the arrangements? You know, I went to her place and whatnot. So she took out a little tape recorder. And I played the melody, a few chords, of each one of these conversations, you know. And uh, that was it. So after that, she created these incredible arrangements. And we had Johnny Griffin on tenor saxophone, Ray Coburn on trumpet, Adri Sulman on one piece on the blues, and Charlie Bassett. Jambi and Nasser, and that was a group, and, and Melbourne Trombone. And on that small group, she got this big sound of the music, and it was so different, you know, it was so different. It's so funny because Arturo O'Farrell's wife, she was five years old at that particular time, and one song, one children's song I wanted to be for the children of the Caribbean. So her father was from the Caribbean, and I wrote a piece called Little Susan, which featured Charlie's percent. So that was the beginning. And then we realized we had several things in common. Number one, she introduced me to Mary Lou Williams. So you can imagine being with these two queens, these two heavyweights. Because compared to them, I'm very lightweight. I didn't have a big band experience. I didn't have the experience of Melba and Mary Lou. And, you know, they were just simply giants, but they're also African American women. And but both were rangers. So I met Mary Lou through Melba, but I try to make it in a nutshell. Melba listened to a spirit. Our music is spirit. And my father always told me when I was a little boy, he said, my son, he said, you are African born in America. Therefore, you have to study the history of African civilizations before Africa was invaded from the north. You have to study the great empires of Africa. So as a boy, I would go to Latinburn, I read about ancient Egypt, I used to imagine myself. And my dad also said something else. He said, to understand me and your mother better. My father was his Panamanian, Jamaican culture, my mother was Virginia culture. I'm born in Brooklyn, and they spoke different. <laughs> they had different rhythms, but they were the same people. Mm -hmm. I grew up with the same food, the same nourishment. And we also, the black church was extremely important. Because they taught us, and this was the neighborhood, because they taught us, number one is the creator. And our music that we call jazz, which is what I call African-American cultural music, classical music, because without Africa, there would have been no jazz, no blues. African people brought their spirituality from the motherland. So Melba and I were very much in tune to learn about more about ourselves and more about our parents, more about our grandparents, and more about those who we never see. And my dad would always say, son, you have to always have respect. You have to respect those grand, grand, grands that you never saw. They were born here as Africans. So what else can you do? What else can you be for an African? Even though you haven't seen them, but it's their spirit. So Melba and I, we did so many things together, but I, I, when I would talk about, I think, would be Uhuru Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, 1960, 17 African countries got their independence. Before that, it was British East Africa, French West Africa, Belgian Congo. The whole continent was occupied by Europe, by the people from the north. So they got 17 countries that got their independence, and we wanted to do a work of music 
to celebrate our ancient ancestors. As blacks and youth would say, our ancestral home, the home of the whole entire planet. Everybody on the planet has got African blood because we all started there. That's right. We all started there. And if we travel, Mother Nature paint us different colors to deal with the snow or the ice or whatever. It's very deep. So we got together, and Melvin was so great because she knew all the giants. So we're going to get a big band together. We got to get Bud Johnson. We got to get Quentin Jackson. We got to fly slide after. We got to go to those great musicians who know the culture, who've done everything in music, travel all over the planet with big bands, small groups, and arrangements. So we got together, and I want to have a freedom poem to celebrate Africa's independence. And I went to Langston Hughes, and I said, Langston, I would like to have a freedom poem. Langston said, OK. And I said, I want to have a piece for the African woman, our mothers, our sisters, our aunts. Those sisters are always in the background always supporting us, but we never get the, the recognition, let's put it that way. So we got together with Langston, and I wrote a piece called African Lady. And African Lady was dedicated to the African woman, whether she's in Mississippi, or Congo, or Georgia, or Brazil, wherever she is, she has that same function. To nourish us, to feed us, to take care of us when we like this. So when I was in that black church as a little boy, and I'd be in that church, and that church would be hot. And the sisters would be swinging, and the organ, and all that. And you know, you can't go to the toilet for so many times. Because <laughs> <laughs> the sisters block, block you in, right? <laughs> and I used to sit there and, 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 and hear, absorb. I wasn't listening. I wanted to get out and play. But the point was that I was already absorbing African culture. So what we call jazz, what we call blues, when I'm talking to Dalton about this, he said, I don't play jazz. He said, I play it, I my music. When Duke Woodrow was sitting out in 1966, he said, Mr. Ellington, a second-lead journalist said, how do you like African music? Duke said, I've been playing African music for 35 years. <laughs> I go to Max Roach's house, here's Charlie Parker, here's Dizzy, working on a Cabana beat, Cabana Bop, where Dizzy brought Channel Bozo, from Cuba. So when you look at African people, wherever we have been taken, whether it's Brazil or Venezuela or Cuba or Mississippi, New Orleans, we have that African spirituality. And the ancient Egyptians have a word for that. The word is called Turaf. That means ancestral memory. That means that even we're here today, what happened five, ten thousand years ago can come out in our music. The way we approach life, the way we dance, the way we argue where we do everything. Mother Africa is always there. So we did this work of music, and uh, it was so be beautiful. Mel Melba, oh my God. She had cats writing music the night before the recording date, on the ceiling, or on the walls. She, everybody was writing. <laughs> the poor copyist, his ankles were swollen. We had to carry him down the stairs and get him to the studio mm. to write music. She conducted 33 musicians, two singers, rhythm section, Candida, Ola Tunji, Ron Carter, George Vivier, Charlie Bassett. I go on the rhythm, the rhythm section. Slide Hampton was on that day. And it was called Uhuru Africa, and Melbourne conducted. But she was, for me, she was a spirit because my whole life in music, I came very late. When I go to Max Roach's house, I was in the restaurant business with my dad. I never thought I was going to be a professional musician. My piano teacher gave up after three years. <laughs> True story. I told my father, save your money. This kid ain't going to never play music. <laughs> True story. My pop got another piano teacher. But the music came to me, African-American culture. We will never survive racism or slavery without that music. Louis Joy will make you laugh. Louis Armstrong will take you someplace else. So the further you go back, which I was taught, you learn more about African American people. You realize that we are descendants of Mother Africa. And we approach life like that. So Melba 
When this recording came out, it was a little controversial because you're not supposed to identify with Africa. The image of Africa was always terrible up until this minute. We still don't know how much Africa has given the world. We don't have, to have a clue. I lived seven years in Morocco. I traveled 18 countries in Africa, and I always look for the oldest people and the oldest music I can hear that I discovered. That's where we come from. Papa said, ain't nothing new under the sun. That's the place. Why? Because the continent itself is the spiritual center of the planet Earth. Therefore, the music comes out of Africa describes in the Sahara, mm -hmm. music describes the Sahara. In the forest, the music describes the forest. All of our music describes our environment. Well, we're lucky to grow up in New York, because everybody come from New York, whether Tommy Flanagan or Art Tatum or whatever. Everybody come from New York. So we absorb all the rhythms of Africa in its variations. New Orleans, Pittsburgh, wherever you name it, and Melbourne, listen from Kansas City to Los Angeles, you see. So, as I said the other night at the concert, this is not just, for me, it's a great honor, but we, we come from great ancestors. I'm very lucky. I knew Max Roach's mother and father. I knew Monk's mother and his brother, you see. So we grew up knowing the parents of these giants. And their foundation was African, African American. Mm. Where we cook our food, where we dance, where we argue, where we cuss each other out, all that stuff. <laughs> it's, it's Mother African that survived. And Dizzy knew this. So when Dizzy brought Channel Pozo from, from Cuba, and I heard that African Cuban drum with Dizzy's orchestra, it was beautiful. Dizzy was writing music about ancient empires in the late 40s. You wrote a work called Kush. Kush is the ancient civilization of Nubia, before ancient Egypt, you see. So the further you go back, you realize that royalty that preceded us, that music described the way our people lived. If you listen to Louis Armstrong, you listen to Duke Ellington, you listen to the words of the song, the song describes African-American life at that particular time. So if you want to know about your ancestors, you've got to go back. Every morning, I listen to Louis Armstrong, discover something I never heard before. I listen to Duke Ellington, I discover nothing here before. Because these are like spiritual people that the Creator has sent down to give the world beauty and love, but also give our people that pride that was deliberately taken away from us. Our hair is no good, your skin is no good, blah, 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 blah. But Melba listened. She was that quiet, spiritual power. She's a great woman. She said very little. Before she could really do a concert or something like that, she said to the ladies who she knew, get me a pair of shoes. <laughs> she didn't want to do nothing but write music. Mm. Just one more thing I'd like to say about Melba. She had a stroke in 1986. And uh, she was back in California. She could no longer play because she's paralyzed on one side. And I had an opportunity to, to do uh, on Verve out of Paris. I want to do the spirit of our ancestors because through our music, I, I want to describe that great, great grandmother that I never saw. I want people to feel and hear her, to realize that we didn't come from nowhere. We come from great civilizations, great civilizations, ancient Africa, Egypt, Songhe, Ghana, all these empires. And the traditional people, they don't go to a store and buy an instrument. They make the instruments. With the Ganawa people of Morocco, the black civilization, I spent 40 years with these people. They do things in music I could never do because they are tuned with the universe, you see. And that's so important. They have a spiritual power in music which has been passed down to us. But the further we go back, we realize the power of a Louis Armstrong, of a Billy Hardy of an auntie, of an Earl Hines, et cetera, et cetera. That's our royalty, you see. So that, to honor Melvin, listen to myself, I'm, I'm, I'm just moved and I'm thrilled. But I just want to let you know where all that comes from. Mom and Bob and Grandma and Grandma, <laughs> the whole way back. Those who we never saw. Thank you so much, and a speech. Thank you. <laughs>
going to say something about Trent Belva's friendship with Dexter Gordon, but and her friendship with you. But then Slag walked in the room. So uh -huh. then we have to talk about Dexter's friendship with Slag Hampton. Mm -hmm. And the album that Slag wrote for Dexter, Sophisticated Giant. And he asked Melba, how'd you like that album? When we went to Jamaica, mm -hmm. when Melba was living there, the first thing he said to her, did you hear the album? Mm -hmm. She was like, that's a bad album. That's a bad <laughs> album. And they, in Jamaica, when we went on vacation, they picked up their friendship from when they were in junior high school together. Wow. They talk, and, and I wanted to disagree, excuse me, with Janice about the self-talk, because she had Alma Hightower as a teacher, and I'm, she had Sam Brown. I'm talking about when she was little, she was playing the trombone before she came to okay, Los Angeles. Okay, but when she, when she came from Kansas City to Los Angeles, Dexter said she was the best musician in junior high school, and in high school, and she taught everybody else how to write music. Mm -hmm. He said they, they didn't know how to write music. They And she used to say to him, there are no hard keys. You have to play in all the keys. Did you practice? <laughs> and when, and in um, 1947, June 5th, he had this record day. That's, I remember that. Which interview. Oh, it was, um, in this journal, of the Center for Black Music Research is an entire issue on Melba. And so what I wanted to do was look at this record session from 2 to 5 p.m. on June 5th, 1947. And she says in an interview, Dexter called me up to be on the session. I told him, oh no, oh no, I'm not gonna be on the session. And he said, mama, be there, two o'clock. <laughs> and she said, they were calling me mama in junior high school wow. because I used to get after them about drinking wine and smoking cigarettes. <laughs> so this friendship, so okay, in 47 she's on the record date. Dexter's born in 23, so that made him 24, right? So she's 21. So they're on the record date, but they're already friends from junior high, right? So all those years later, they start saying, whatever happened to this one? They were talking about people they went to high school with, right? Yeah. In Jamaica. And they also did this thing that um, Dick Griffin did. Did you hear this thing where he said to Slide, B flat, E minor, seven, eight. You know how yeah. musicians talk in <laughs> letters and numbers? <laughs> in, letter, in the co musician code in any place in the world, right? <laughs> they just did it. You know, they knew, yeah, right. and she, and then, that's what happened with Melba and Dexter. They had this long conversation about the court changes to something. Right. I don't know what it was, but it was exactly that mm -hmm. way that you brought right. up, right. you know, what, yeah. what happens in the bridge of this right. and that, right? But yeah. um, anyway, I just, there's the continuity about the friendship with Melba that she kept her friends. And plus she could say, Dexter said, I never forget what she said to me, you know, practice and write, practice and write, you'll be okay, right? And she was younger, but she was telling him, you'll be all right, you'll be all right, you know, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
the thing we got to remember, women are life givers. They're the life giver. The men are the war members. The men are war members. If they come and tell you to send your child to a war to become a hero, tell them no. And oh, the most important word in the dictionary. And oh, 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 oh. Right. Don't do it. Listen to Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker set up music for everybody that came after him for a long, long time. J.J. Johnson, nobody plays the trombone like that. Mm -hmm. Curtis Ford. But the one thing is that they make sure that they don't talk about those guys on the radio so they hope they'll be forgotten. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't let them forget them. That's right. Right. Yeah. Nobody can sing like Debbie Epstein and Sarah Vaughn and, and Billy Holiday. Nobody can sing like that. We need to be hearing that all the time. They need to hear it too. Everybody needs to hear it. I'm sorry if my words are a little hard. about the music, so I can't talk about Melba and the music. But we went down to uh, the first women's jazz festival in Kansas City, the second one, and Melba was there. And I went down with 17 New York women to play for the Kansas City Jazz Festival for, for free. And National Endowment gave us $5,000 to travel. And, um, we, we met Melba there, and she just wanted to come back to New York. So I said to her that she should come back to New York. Well, she came, and then she didn't want to do the uh, make a band or orchestra. She just wanted to play, and she wanted to write, and she wanted to be back in New York. So I said, well, you should have a co company call it. Melba Liston and Company, or Melba Liston and Friends, or Melba Liston something. So she finally did. And uh, the National Endowment at this, I had put her, placed her in several places to play. And, and she loved it with this group. And I, at first she was gonna use all women from the Women's Jazz Festival. I mean, coming from the Women's Jazz Festival. She thought she should have all women. And so we had, I can't remember if, who the other two people were. But they were all women at first. And all of us in company. It was, um, let's see, it was, uh, um, oh, that's the wrong side. The first uh, she had and company? Dorothy Dodgen on drums, yeah. Sharon Freeman on piano, uh, Erica Lindsay on soprano, Sax, tenor, sax and flute, and Carlene Ray on bass. Oh, yeah. Carlene was my straw boss on everything. Oh, yeah. she, she was the straw boss on everything. But then, and she had a, a, somebody else on trombone? Me. Oh, Jan you, you, Jan. <laughs> <laughs> I knew, I knew it was you. She was a teacher for all of us. And for some yeah. reason, you had to leave, and so, Jean, she, Jean she asked uh, uh, Theodore, I mean Ted Kelly, to take over the trombone. And then, yeah, it was Jean Feinberg. Jean was Feinberg on, with the first group. Right, right. Sabrano Sax. And she had to leave for some reason. So she brought in Luther Francois. Oh, so that was her Jamaica. company. And so then the National Endowment mm -hmm. gave us a tour right. of uh, Malaysia. <coughs> Kaula Lumba, Kaula Lumba, something like that, and Fiji. And it took weeks, a couple of weeks, and we played every single night. They had us somewhere. And uh, uh, she, I was just going to tell you some of the places that we played, so in case you recognize any of them. Let's see. In, in uh, Malaysia, we played October 18 in Taichung, October 19 in Koa Suang. Okay. And then we had dinner at the Hotel Kingdom, 
And uh, on the 19th, they gave us dinner. And on the 20th, we played ping pong. And then on the 21st, they had a reception for us at uh, Leo Suru <coughs> Sun Yat in something. In Kuala Lumpur, we did two concerts. And uh, Saturday, October 25, and Sunday, October 26. And then we went to Fiji. And on October 30, we did a free concert. Well, on the 29th, we did a concert. And then on the 30th, we did a free concert at the embassy. Now, I have a picture of the concert at the embassy, but you know I can't think of the lady's name. And I, these, these will go to uh, Randy's connection at the Chicago. I just found them, you know. And this is a picture of the, of the group. But I can't remember the lady's name. I have it somewhere else. Oh, Let me just tell you, if you, if anybody's interested, when they go online and look at the uh, Chlor Bryant interview with Malba, they have this strange name there, but they're talking about Kobe. <laughs> Whenever you see this strange spelling, this name, they're talking about Kobe Narita. So if you're online looking at that Smithsonian interview, <laughs> Just bear that in mind. She's got some gorgeous pictures here. And the, the um, <clears throat> laminated things that I had also, you can look at them uh, when we're finished. I, um, can we pass them around? Well, no, because I'm going to. She got one. I have to make copies. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Then I'll see. give them to the Chicago come up and see. College. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, oh. um, they had. Everybody that was anybody was there. President of the Far Eastern Artist Management, a jazz composer, conductor, President of New Aspect Promotion Center, Pro Musica Artist Management President. Oh, and they're all Asian names. Can't read them. The Hong Foundation, Music Library, Far Eastern Artist Management. Oh, every chairman, every director, every they all came to that reception. So many people are so nice. And uh, the guy who wrote the conversations, jazz conversations, what's his, what's his name? He's doing the bio for Dottie Dodgen. So I, 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 I'm finally glad I found this picture. Because Dottie wants to put them in her book. Beautiful. Dottie's yeah, on wonderful. drums. That's Erica, Carleen, and the lady. I think she's an ambassador. Ambassador, something like that. But I'll find her name before I give you the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and let me see, I guess that's it. Or the guest list up there. And when they honored um, Melba Liston and the manager, Narita, I wasn't the manager. Uh, I never was a manager. Um, let me see. Deputy Section Chief, Chief Cultural Affairs Section, Secretary. It was all it was all presence and director of the China evening. So many people were there. It's just great. Anyway, so we went there and uh, on the way back we did George Green's um, thing at Nice, and there was a couple other places we went. But Melba wouldn't go on the road with George Green. Always sent people out, you know, on extra things, but didn't pay much. But <laughs> she wouldn't do it. <laughs> She just ref refused. <coughs> so I said to George, well, she won't do it. I mean, you know, she can't do it. So he said, well, I'll be glad when you're back to not being a manager. I said, I'm not a manager. <laughs> <laughs> and then we came back. And when she uh, lived in uh, New York, uh -huh. she lived on 43rd Street, two blocks away from Copeland's, which was my favorite restaurant. I used to go there every day for her and buy food for her. And uh, um, I guess when she left, this uh, friend named Smith, I can't remember her first name, 
for the Max magazine, had given her the money to go to L.A., and Melba gave her the apartment. So when she came back, I did a move for Melba uh, thing and raised three thousand dollars for my readership, and we brought her back, and uh, and then we I, we paid her rent and we paid for the person to take care of her uh, because she needed care then when she came back. And the one thing about her that I fought with her about was, it's the only thing we ever fought about, she would not do her physical therapy. I do physical therapy every day, it doesn't help, but I do it. <laughs> but anyway, I read something about Randy and it said that, that, that she did learn to use her arm again. She just did not use her arm, you know. And so she used it again and she worked at the computer. She could work the computer. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I remember her telling me that she had to go back to LA to die. Mm -hmm. She said it's time for her to leave. Mm -hmm. So, and then it was also time for me to leave the jet. The jazz center in 88. I had moved 88. I had moved from that. Manhattan to Long Island. So we didn't keep in touch. And so she, I really miss her. Mm -hmm. She had this big, lush sound. She sounded so beautiful. So, mm -hmm. Helping us um, with our memories of Melba. I think Kobe found all of this memorabilia, this archival stuff last after we night. talked last <laughs> night. <laughs> she I said, I'm sorry night. for calling you so late, but uh, and, and then she went night. to work to find all this wonderful information. <laughs> but Randy, uh, Janice, first of all, um, she's amazing. And the next thing I know, she's calling me back, telling me, uh, here's Leslie Drayton's phone number. And so <laughs> Faustina, and after the concert, she was, she was in the uh, band with, with Drayton. And so she's pushing me, and I'm calling California. Well, the next thing I know, he's telling me this wonderful story about after Kobe said mother went back to California. And... She went back to die, but she didn't die immediately. So she says to Leslie, Leslie says, we have to do your music, and you have to get up and do this. And, and, right. But you, you're right. in the band, Melba, who's going to get you up? And he, she said to him, you are. <laughs> and they worked daily right. on her music. He probably needs a grant to go to Chicago because he has information that the archivists there just have no clue. Mm. So I hope he gets the money, I hope he gets the grant, and works on that music. But I just had to share that, because she said she went to die, but she lived long enough to continue working on her music two or three more years before she passed. Amazing. Also, I wanted to add that um, Melba had championed women's bands uh, Several times in her career, she had put together some of the finest women's uh, groups, most, mostly small groups, oh, I think, sure. before Melba Liston and Company. And uh, um, she had also worked with um, Billie Holiday, of course, going through, going through the South, and had relationships with uh, Mary Lou Williams. Right. She wrote arrangements for Mary Lou Williams. So she was always in touch with uh, oh, all the singers, of course, there were many singers that Gloria she, Lynn, Gloria, she wrote Gloria, uh, arrangements Gloria. for, Gloria Lynn, uh, um, Melba, would you like to talk a little bit more about her involvement with um, women, and um, especially, well, instrumentalists and um, a lot of vocalists that she worked with arrangements for? When I think about the love that Kofi has given all these jazz musicians, and she said she didn't know anything about it, and how she cared for us and nurtured us and was always thinking of us and sending us here and there. I just, it's just really wonderful. I just, I really get teary-eyed. I, uh, 
they are uh, kind of a garage part of, of the house, uh, Mary uh, and, um, and Thelma's house, her aunt's, um, was where they, they just fixed this place up for, for Melba to write. She'd be back there all the time. Uh, or they'd make sure she was back there. It was really something. And I've been slapping myself because I didn't get her to write anything for me. I don't know why I did that. Same thing with Cedar Walton. I always think about, I don't know why. I don't ask these people who are around me who want to write, wanted to write for me. I find out later. But anyway, Melba was just, um, just having her there was just really something. And it was just, mm, I can't even describe what it felt like being there in the house and <clears throat> hanging out and going over there a few days. I could go. But I'm glad I am a namesake. And I do want to talk about these singers that, that Slider was talking about in our history. I, I got a master's in jazz history and research from Rutgers as I took my own history. Because I told him, I said, I'm in, I'm in, this, I'm in this history. I work with, with, with Lyle Hampton and Joe Wilson and uh, uh, Georgie Ald and uh, Tommy Flanagan and, and people like that, all in LA. But there's a separation there that I really don't care for. And I really hope we can close it because it, it, we got to save this music. I, 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 in the 10 years I've been out at Rutgers, I, I, I mean, I, I'm at Old Westbury, I have not bought, used a textbook in my jazz class or my uh, world uh, history class because there's so many lies and I told McGraw-Hill, I will not contribute anymore to this lie that you're dealing with. You're talking about, you're using an elephant's journal in the same breath as you have Diane Shure. And um, I mean, it's just uh, ridiculous. And so I said to them, I will not use your textbooks. So I don't use their textbooks. And, and I, there was one that had a, all the credits of all these PhDs in music. And I said, are you kidding me? I said, I'm gonna wager you, I'm going to wager you that three of the, only three of those guys have been on the bandstand. And probably one none of them can't play. I mean, I just had to really talk to them that way because they don't understand what's, they do understand what's going on. You're trying to replace something that cannot be replaced. I mean, Billy Eckstein, I did his TV show, and he, I know Billy's in, and Diz too. My dad sang with Dizzy Gillespie, Melvin Moore, my father's name was, and he recorded with me, you can find him online. And you know that's my dad. That was dad, Randy's dad. <laughs> Randy was always talking to my dad. You know, they were always close, as well as Melba. You know, like I said, Melba and I talked about, I wish I had that wild picture here. We talked about um, Melvin, music, and men. That was our theme when we talked. But anyhow, so you know Randy was in there. But anyway, because they work so close together. But anyway, uh, the Gloria Lynn's music, uh, Billy Holiday, Billy Eckstein, Marvin Gaye, her, all of her adventures in, at Motown uh, were just so very important. We don't want to leave the singers out because it's too important. I, as I said on the panel last night, the other night, I said I'd like to take each one of their arrangements and redo it. Just you sing over their arrangements, the ones that she did, and reissue something. I would really like to do that. It would be, I think, it would be really something very special. But and I'd really like to be a part of it. Since I wasn't as much of a part of it as I wanted to when she was alive, I'd like to certainly keep her alive through those those recordings and those arrangements. So anyway, the history, you guys gotta watch out. They're trying to change everything. Every the, the word European music in this issue of the McGraw Hill book that they sent me on jazz, it's just ridiculous. You know, you look at it and it says everything it says is that the Europeans did this and they did that. I said, listen. Just because we were oral and we weren't writing anything down doesn't mean that we didn't do, we did everything. We were here first, if you look at all those old instruments, I show them to my students, and if you look at all those old instruments, they're all been adapted. They were, they were already the way they are now, except for a few adaptations. We must understand that Africa, everything, the creator decided that everything should begin in Africa, so everything began in Africa. Art, all the arts, everything. The drum choirs, the everything, everything we see about this music is there, came from there. The spirit of it, it's nuance that they're trying to, you know, I want to teach a class on nuance. I don't know how I would do that. But somebody needs to do that. I need to say that because people don't understand the things that are not so evident or the things that are hidden within us that come out through our roots. Like Randy talked about last night. I really wish they, I hope they recorded what you said last night. 
because they really, I'm, and I'm so passionate about this, and my students, when they do their evaluation, she's so passionate about this music. And, <laughs> well, because it's so deep, it's so deeply rooted in history, and it's ours, and we need to hold on to it and make sure it stays as close to it as we can keep it, because it's so, it's so precious, and I love it so much. I really love it. Thank you very much. When I was reading about her, I wrote this little poem. I don't know if it's naive, but anyway, here's the one. Swan Life was Melba. And if you see the painting in the back, I did do this sort of like a mermaid kind of female figure for, for Melba. First it was created in clay, and then it was uh, cast in glass. Uh, if you look at the piece, you'll see, you also see if you look closely, you'll see her face in some of the circles. You have to look closely at that piece, because I think and she also represents Ye Minya. So it, it's a piece that, it, it's to show the beauty of her spirit. And I'm glad I sort of captured her spirit without really knowing her, just from reading uh, uh, vignettes and, and reading about the Yoruba <coughs> Africa and reading, uh, uh, I had to do my research. I didn't want to just approach this in the blind. But I did write this poem, and um, I'll read this. The painting for the exhibition was inspired by the magnificent African spirit embodied, embodied in the musical artistry of the great pianist Randy Weston and the trombonist Melba Liston. I give thanks to Randy and Melba for creating royal and exalted musical improvisations that are in touch with the universe. Their compositions conjure the sky and earth spirits of Africa. I attempted to evoke the same exotic universal spirit in this painting. I give thanks to Randy and Melba for global rhythmic musical creations of Africa that will always inspire and inform my visual compositions. And this is a poem. Swan-like was Melba, graceful, suave, beautiful, elegant in white. Her trombone melodic, her trombone smooth, her sound caressed gently, gentle as a gliding swan. Swan-like was Melba, and royal, inspiring, and majestic is Randy. Well, oh, it's funny. It's, it's really beautiful that Randy and, and Charlotte brought up Africa because we're talking about the root of these cultures that we're talking about, and I don't mean it figuratively, I mean it literally. I have a, a good friend uh, in Tume who uh, used to be a drummer, he played with my he did, he did a lot of music. And one day I was with him and the father who raised him, not his biological father, who was Jimmy Heath, but the father who raised him, whose name was James Foreman. And he was, he was uh, his name is Hen Gates also, he was a piano player in Dizzy's band. And he was the piano when Dizzy and Channel when Channel was in Dizzy's band. And so he said we would sit in the front seats, Channel would sit behind us and he would drum and sing on the seats and we'd notate it. But what was Channel singing? Channel singing Palo songs, Congo songs from Cuba. He's singing Abaqua songs. Abaqua is a leopard society from Cross River that goes into Cuba and is still alive in Cuba. He's singing these songs. So we're listening to the bebop. We're listening to African songs in the, in, the, in the contemporary form. Africa is not some fossilized form. It's not something in the past, it's living right now. So when you hear some of those bebop tunes from Dizzy, Mike Monteca, you know, when you listen to those tunes, you're listening to Afro-Cuban culture, which is African culture, which is consciously African culture. You're listening to Leopard Society songs that you hear bebop. It's an incredible connection that we don't always draw, but it's always there. You know, I mean, if you're, this, you're talking about foundation, it is the foundation we can't get rid of if we wanted to. <laughs> we shouldn't want to. What else could we stand on? We stand on that. Yes, we do. You know, so I mean, it, it's really beautiful that, that Charlotte and then Randy both introduced Africa again as part of the formative, the, 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 the formative elements in the United States. You know, whenever people talk about modernity in the, in the Americas, they're talking about the African contribution. Yeah, because You know, no, that it's, it's really funny. The very thing we're accused of not being part of, we created. <laughs> <laughs> About you. I'm passionate about these ideas. So this, is, this is important. This is how we are grounded on the planet. Mm -hmm. We aren't some uh, kind of add-on to what's flowing in terms of world culture. No. We're the foundation of world culture. Amen. That's you right. Know, I mean, it's, it's really funny. That's, 
now we can open the, the, the floor for questions. The gentleman would like to know what each person is working what, 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 on now. What are they working on now? Is it all right if I start here? Uh, Ed, I, I also, I'm also, I'm a photographer, but I'm also a curator. And my curatorial team is here. It's Robert Amelia and Deirdre Harris Kelly. And we're working on a show at uh, Nathan Cummings Foundation, which will open in November 6th. And it, the show is about Kamonge, an African American group that's 51 years old. Uh, I we argued for 50 years, but still arguing. <laughs> and and, and Foco, a Latino group that started 41 years ago. So we're doing a joint exhibit uh, talking about, uh, it's called um, Kamonge and in Foco, Advancing the Frame, talking about social commitment in art and in uh, terms of uh, documentary and art, fine art photography. So we're, that show will open next week, in the 6th of November at Nathan Cummings Foundation. As I mentioned before, I am now living in Pittsburgh, and Errol, he has, he's back there, um, we purchased a building from the city of Pittsburgh for $10,000. Check that out. Mm -hmm. A two-story building. <laughs> a two-story building that we're going to put in addition to live on top. It's called MOCA, which is Mo and Ka, and it's also Mecca of culture with a K and art. This is a picture I have, I can give, I do have more here. But this is a picture of the building. Right now it's not in this shape, of course, but we are getting funding and we may have a Kiva, I need 15 people, yes. 15 that are, uh, say that they're going to get $5 in order for us to get the little Kiva thing going. So I'll have, I would like to get your name and, and um, email addresses so that I can, when I'm home, do that. Yeah, so this is a place, yeah. this is a, a, we're in the Hill District, which is where most of this music, we, uh, Claude McKay call it the crossroads of, crossroads of, of uh, culture, the Hill District, but you, it's a sad what happened to it after, mm -hmm. after the riots. It's nothing like it was then. So what we want to do is bring the culture back to the Hill, because it's going to be an entirely different uh, story now. You're going to see new buildings, you're not going to see that rich essence. They destroyed the place, but we're going to bring it back. Mm -hmm. We want to bring back the music, the culture, the music, and so that we can bring back the spirit that was so integral to the all the history in the Hill District. So that's what Mo and I are working on now. Mm -hmm. And artistically, I'm uh, working on a uh, piece, uh, uh, starting piece called The Morning Mothers, and but that's a whole nother, I don't want to even get into that right now because it's just a little bit too sad what is going on with uh, gun with you know gun rights and all that kind of thing so i just don't i don't want to mention it now i don't think it's the right time but i am working on that so that's that's what i'm currently working on this building mocha and also this series and i would also like to do a piece a series on um, billy Strayhorn, mm -hmm. um to, uh, with his um, with Billy Strayhorn, who is from Pittsburgh, because I always remember Lush Life. It's such a wonderful tune. Thank you. Hi. Right now I have every Friday night open mic going at uh, one at 5198th Avenue. Every Friday night, 10, uh, 7.30 to 10.30 with Frank Owens on piano. He's a marvelous pianist. And uh, so anybody wants to come, it's $10. <laughs> and it doesn't pay for the evening, but it's $10. And you get to sing, or you get the audience, or you get to tap dance, or read a poem. <laughs> I'm also have a, a concert coming up next Friday. And I'm also advertising another concert that's not mine for the same night happens. And the concert on mine is at Zeb's, which is 223 West 28th Street between 7th and 8th Avenues, only $20, 15 if you're a member of the open mic, or a senior or a student. And it's, uh, but uh, it features, um, Willie Mae Perry is featured, she's a fine singer. Frank Owens is a trio, and uh, Saul Rubin, who owns Zips, is a, is a special guest on a guitar. It's a wonderful guitar. He toured with 
Sonny Rollins last November, when Sonny was well, you know. And, uh, oh my goodness, I forgot the name of him. Things leave me. Uh, wow. I forgot the name of the star. It'll come to you. Anyway, it, it's, it's this Friday. Well, in the meantime, yes. Colby, can you tell us the name of your organization? I used to know it years ago. Well, yeah, I call it Jazz Center of New York now. Jazz what? Jazz Center of New York. I did it in 83 before be Lincoln else. Center became so big, you know. <laughs> I, I, I uh, trademarked it in uh, 83. Okay. So. All right. And before that, it was Universal, Universal Jazz, Jazz Coalition. That's, what That's the one I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. And uh, and then to starting tomorrow, I'm joining her committee to get the symposium started. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> this is just we're sort of halfway through what we proposed about a, over a year ago, and. When I first talked to Randy about doing it, it been so long ago he probably forgot. But he promised to do the performance, which which we did Friday. It was beautiful. That was wonderful. With our special guests, this art exhibit, which will run until November eighth, uh, the closing is on the eighth, and. We had also proposed a symposium on Melba as well as workshops, free workshops for children to learn her music. So Kobe's joined the forces and she'll be making phone calls or whatever. We're glad to have her. We want to make the workshops happen. Arturo Farrell has given us a letter of support for the workshops and the symposium, hopefully at the Schomburg. We'll keep you posted. But thank you so much for supporting what we've done so far. Well, the right idea, I'm sorry. Did you want somebody? You, you're addressing it to somebody? Oh, oh, All questions yeah, in a minute. Oh, sorry. I can wait, but if okay. you have something to say, I can wait. Okay, oh, oh, we came up with about 10 artists that, um, I came up with a list of about 10 artists that did that Melba arranged for, and so I said I wanted to re-record that. So I'm going to go on Facebook, like Kickstarter or something, because that that money comes in fast, and we can uh, really keep Melba alive by using these arrangements. I'm going to sing all of them, and I, I, the guy who came from Chicago, from Columbia, where her music is stored, uh, archived. Um, Jeff Branfield. Yeah, Jeff Branfield. He he said that he has a lot of those arrangements, and so does somebody else here in town who has. Uh, Maxine. No. Who? Maxine? Who? Is it Maxine? No, it was a, a guy who, I can't think of his name now. Sandy, you know who I'm talking about because he has some of Clifford's music. Don Sickler says he has some of the arrangements. So it almost looks like we're going to be able to do all those uh, because they have those arrangements on hand. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going to sing them. All right. Oh, my book. And uh, my in my uh, thesis, um, I uh, it's called Jazz Widows, and it's a, a, a collection of interviews I did uh, from eight jazz women here on the East Coast. So I'm adding um, uh, what's her name? Flip Mann, uh, Shelley Mann's wife, is consented to. Um, to be a part of the collection. It's, it's a really, I'm excited about it. The, the, the book is called Jazz Widows. It's my thesis, huh? Why are the other people here? Huh? Why are the people here? So when are you going to Oh, the people in it are uh, Cecilia Foster, um, uh, Gloria Ware, Sandy Jordan, can't get away from them. <laughs> um, um, Gail, Rose Gales, um, um, what's his name? <laughs> Saxophone player from, they have a festival. Um, James Moody, uh, Linda Moody, Linda. Um, well, a, a local, well, um, uh, Donna, Donna Carter, who was married to Charles, um, McGee. what? McGee. Charles McGee, and the last one was who? 
They're eight. I don't know why I didn't forget them because I was feel like I was working on them all the time. But any Maxine, I couldn't Maxine couldn't get Maxine. I tried. Anyway, um, I tried. I tried everybody I could. Oh, Monica Getz, Stan Getz, with him, uh, who was doing wonderful things with the violence, domestic violence, and that. Just as um, um, uh, Flip Man is doing with Shelly Man's music, uh, she's doing wonderful things. So. All of them are doing wonderful things in the name of jazz, in the name of humanity. It's a wonderful, 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 wonderful collection. When will it be out? I, I, I hope it will be out this spring. And I have another book that's going to be out by um, before um, November 11th. I went to Vietnam in 1969 to sing for the troops. They, just to tell you the truth, they were not sending any black women or Hispanic women, so I told them I would go when I was in L.A. So I went twice, once with Georgie Jessel, but my own show was first. I had all jazz musicians with me, and we had a wonderful time, and I'm gonna be in the Veterans Day Parade. I got an invitation from the Department of Defense. And um, on the 11th, on the Vietnam float, with 10 uh, Vietnam. Vietnam veterans who have been in the hospital, uh, connected to the VA hospital on the first day. Excellent. I'm really proud of that. But anyway, all in the name of jazz. <laughs>
we got to be very tight. So this piece that I uh, I did uh, that's going to be on, on exhibit on in the opening, it's 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 a big T, abstract T, and and uh, and on this side is it's called uh, Brown Round Midnight in Bright Mississippi is the title. So Round Midnight is a dark section of this really in black and everything, and, um, and then Bright Mississippi is in red. So come see the piece, you can see all of that is in there. And when I did the piece on Melba, again, it was all about what I wanted to project of that person. It's music, a big M there, you won't see it if you can abstract it, and it's music for Melba. So that's what I'm working on, and now I have to pro uh, promote this in art. I have a solo exhibition coming up in February at the uh, Fallon Dickinson University in, in Teaneck, New Jersey. Wow. So I am just busy. I don't sleep. Three hours. <laughs> <laughs> Practice during the day and paint at night or whatever. All right. <laughs> One more thing to say to you. Don't forget Melba Lister. You, you gotcha. Don't forget gotcha. the females. Men have had the earth all the time, and we men have it all fucked up. <laughs> Amen. We need, women, we need women to run more. Than Amen. Them. They're the talented ones. They're the ones that do it because they actually have a feeling about it. Men do it so they can get money. Uh oh. Right. And this is something really. This music is very important. Don't forget this man. Don't forget that this music had come that we call improv, that we call jazz and improvisation. That's what you have to do on the planet. But I mean, if you walk out in the car and come back, you're not going to stand and let the car go <laughs> You know, that's what improvisation is about. It's very important to know that. And this whole thing about us being American, African Americans. I'm not an American, I'm an African. I'm not an American. The Americans brought the Germans over here after the war, the white Germans, uh -huh. put them in the place of the, the black soldiers and called black soldiers and natives when they got there. All right. So that's what the Americans do. I know the slide continues to work and practice. When I was with the world of trombones, I never practiced so much in my life. We practiced all day. And that's what slide is doing. Practicing all day and writing for a big band, six horns and six saxophones, six trombones, and all of those things. So I want to also mention that this CD, Melba Liston and Her Bones, is the, I think, the only CD that yeah, is around right. as, uh, with Melba as a leader. And it has resurfaced on the internet. Melba Liston and Her Bones. And it includes Slide Hampton, Jimmy Cleveland, Al Gray, Benny Green, yeah. Benny Powell, and Frank Rehack. And it is excellent. Melba Liston and Her Bones, you can find it on. Amazon. Uh, these are comp her compositions for uh, trombone and rhythm section. Yes, that's me. Maxi? Okay. I'm going to borrow your. I'm completing the biography of Dexter Gordon for University of California Press. As we sit here, I've missed the first deadline. So. <laughs> But I will be done, and it will be published in 2015. Uh, I'm working on uh, several projects bet. at once. <laughs> uh, we performed uh, two years ago at the NYU, the African Doobie Yeah, that's coming. And November everybody, you know, what the purpose of the suite was to go back to the ground again. So we found out the oldest sister, and we could find it, older than Lucy. Lucy's three and a half million years old. And we found a sister older than her, four and a half million years old. And her name is Artipithecus, but we call her Artie for short. So we have Professor Wayne Chandler give the history of Nubia, and how Nubian civilization was the mother of ancient Egypt, all black people. But because of the great Jane Cortez, who was in the form, she wanted me to play behind her in the suite, because part of the suite is to honor the African woman. So then I got the idea, what happened when the first African saw a trombone? What did he, what did he or she do with it? Or the piano, what, what was that? What happened when that first African saw a European instrument? What did he do with it? 
So we put together people like Howard Johnson. Howard Johnson would demonstrate the early tuba. Because my interest is always the oldest, go back as far as we can. Because to go forward, we gotta go back, you see. Mm -hmm. It's very important, we gotta know our origins. Second project is, I talked to uh, Paris, to the guy, his name is Jean-Philippe Bellard. We did many recordings with Melba with him to get him to re-release Uhuru Africa. Mm -hmm. Because Uhuru Africa is a classic. You've mm -hmm. never heard of Slide Hampton and Jimmy Cleveland and Quentin Jackson and Freddie Hubbard, I mean, Yusuf Latif. Everybody's on that recording. So you have help that release. My wife and I, she's right here. Uhuru Africa. We're going to go to Africa very soon, and I want to interview the oldest African musicians I can find. Starting off with the Kanawa people. They were taken as slaves by the Arabs. They were taken from the West African kingdoms. If they had to walk, this happened. Mm. They became soldiers and, and fantastic musicians. So I want to do a series of interviewing my elders. I would love to have been able to interview Yubi Blake when I used to go to his house <laughs> on Stuyvesant Avenue in Brooklyn. I wish I knew then. He would tell me the stories about what happened in 1890. But did you ever hear about Big Leg Willie? Or do so this guy wipe everybody out of the piano? So that's my interest. My autobiography that uh, came out in 2010 is going to come out in paperback in, in, in January. <laughs> But the whole purpose is just what everybody is saying. We uh, have to be responsible, tell the, tell the world, tell our children about that royalty that precede us. How they create this music is a complete mystery to me. Mm. How African people picked up these European instruments mm. and European languages and put that African pulse. Mm. You can call it hip hop, you can call it jazz, you can call it whatever you want. This is Africa's contribution to world civilization. Mm -hmm. And Melba was about that too because we all wanted to want to present the beauty of our people. Grandma, great grandma, great grandpa, all the way back, our people who went through so much pain. But look at the beauty we gave the world through music. Mm -hmm. And let them know. We sing, oh yes, yeah, sorry darling. Uh, November 9th, yeah. we're doing a special concert at NYU to celebrate. James Meese Europe in the 369. These are the ones, James Meese Europe was nobody replaced him. He organized African American musicians. We couldn't join the union at that time. He organized African American musicians, entertainers. He did Carnegie Hall in 1913 with 150 African American musicians. He went to Europe in the army. First ones to bring our music to France and whatnot. This man was incredible, completely forgotten about. See, when I was 17 years old, I went to Lucky Roberts Club up in Hall. And I met Lucky. Lucky is a monster pianist, a monster composer, incredible. And he said something to me. He said, Randy, he said, when James B's Europe died, we died. He said, we never recovered. Now, I caught the last of the Black Musicians Club in New York as a kid. Their clubs were Silas and Abbey. And we should see the older musicians that play with Lucky Middleton or Count Basie, have a few days off. And we go to these clubs. And they, the old timers, they're playing cards and tell us, hey boy, you gonna play here? Make sure you don't get two dollars, one dollar. Our history has been literally left out. Mm. So everything I do is try to bring back the ancestors because they had the wisdom, mm -hmm. they had the patience, and they had the love of us. And when I said before, I met the parents of all these great people. It was wonderful when you meet. Nobody talked about them all his mother's mother, hmm. or his brother, or Max Lewis's mother and father. But they are the ones who brought the best music in the house. My mom and pop to say, <coughs> out of here, Mary Louise, with Andy Kirk. Andy Kirk's band, and mom, would take us to hear the music. So we got to bring back the ancestors because they were wiser than us, they were stronger than us. They were more creative than us. And Duke Ellington, he always say, you know, there's no such thing as modern music. 
He said, Louis, I'm also just as modern as anything else. <laughs> and when people ask me, he said, Randy, listen, he said, what do you think about free jazz? I said, the freest jazz I ever heard was Louis Armstrong. <laughs> and that's the truth, you see. So I continue celebrating my listen, pass the word of the beauty of our women, the beautiful for the black family, the sacrifice that our mothers and fathers and grandmothers had to go through mm -hmm. for me to learn the piano lesson. That's what's missing today. Mm -hmm. But this music is our culture. It's not just jazz. It's a culture of incredible African people. No matter where we were taken, we created beauty. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a bossa in Brazil, whether it's a calypso in Trinidad, mm -hmm. whether it's a reggae in Jamaica, mm -hmm. wherever you find us, but you're also going to find a very powerful spiritual music. Mm -hmm. So that's why this afternoon is so inspiring. And by the way, I have Mr. Sam Gill here. Sam Gill was my first bass player when I recorded in 1954 and 1955. Yeah. That, that, that's the first side of his brother with his uh, Barbados roots. This brother went to Denver, performed with the Denver Symphony Orchestra for 48 years. Imagine a brother doing that with a symphony orchestra. He just retired. He just came in from Denver last night. Sam, welcome. <laughs> just one, one more gentleman I want to mention. This man is a, he's in Brooklyn, and he's the head of the Andy Kirk Foundation. People know who Andy Kirk was. Andy Kirk was a fantastic big man. Donald Sexton. Thank you. He, he disappeared again, huh? He's always the he's always the fans on this guy. Anyhow,
to do arrangements for me, and she told me she would, and then she came ill. But Kobe Narita is because Kobe helped me with my career for many years, and that's how I knew Melba. And as far as the illness is concerned, I wanted to say I'm also on the panel with Jimmy Owens trying to help to get pensions yeah. for the jazz musicians. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make one statement. If you love the music, then please, you must love the musicians. Mm -hmm. know that Jimmy Owens is on our board of directors. But not just that, he was on the original in the 80s when Melba was doing this for us and so many other people. Jimmy was there from the very, very beginning. Jim, Jimmy Owens and Jim Harrison. You may or may not know Jim Harrison. But they were way back then because the idea was conceived even before Wilbur Ware died, and he died in 79. See you know how long ago that was. We had Clifford Jordan, Sandy Jordan, and Jimmy Owens, Jim Harrison, and people like that. So we're just re-emerging and focusing on our royalty like Randy Weston, like Melba Liston, because Melba's music even though you'll read this journal, we have a few of these journals. Uh, if you want one before uh, I leave, they're $15. But if you look at that journal and see that Melbourne music was there but not being used, it was sitting there. I could not believe just to introduce young people to her genius to her music and have them know and understand what she did, how she this path that she carved and the contributions that she made quietly and nobody knows, it's just amazing. So Randy, I want to thank you again. Thank you, I love you. All you who participated, thank you for doing so. Janice, Maxine, Sly, Dick. Melvin, you joined us. Kobe, Charlotte, and Daniel. I have to give the gallery, where's Corinne Jennings and Joe Overstreet, give them a warm thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget that the work, much of the work is uh, for sale. The more you buy, the more you support the artists, you support the gallery, you support the music. Thank you for coming and enjoy uh, little refreshments. Yes. Is there any place where people can make contributions if they want to? You can make contributions, yes. You can do it. You say for the retired musicians, is there a place where people can say contributions? Yes. You can make contributions online, you can the also, jazz the Jazz Foundation, you can support the, yes, you can make contributions. As well as the Wilberware yeah. Institute, uh, as a matter of fact, I just got a check from somebody and another friend did it online, so yes, you can contribute in many ways, any way you want to contribute, you can, can do so. You can go online and sign up as yes. a supporter for the Justice for Jazz Artists campaign. The local 802 is doing, yes. trying to get the clubs where jazz artists work about that. to pay into the existing pension fund yes. that started in 1959. It has $2,800,000,000 here. So you can go online and speak to Jimmy and speak to me. And thank you again for coming.
Thank you, Miguel.